and welcome to day five of Be a Jewish Upstander, a call to action, supporting immigrants and refugees in the time of COVID-19. I'm Max Batashnik, Director of Government and Community Relations for the Jewish Federation of Greater Seattle. Thank you so much for joining us for the final day in this series of learning and advocacy in action. It's a real pleasure and a treat today to have Andrea Soroko Nar with us, who is one of the co-founders of the Jewish Coalition for Immigrant Justice Northwest. She's going to be sharing with us all about the work they do, um, about the Jewish values and texts and teaching that ground their work, how we can get involved, um, and really what it means, you know, for the Jewish community to be an ally to some of these um, really marginalized and struggling communities within the immigrant and refugee space. Before we move forward, I just wanted to review quickly in case you missed earlier presentations in the week. Um, you can check them out on our landing page at jewishinseattle.org if you go to community services. Uh, and the link will also be sent out in the follow-up email as well. So you can see recordings from each day's webinar as well as the action items that our speakers spoke about. Um, and you know, if the Jewish values piece is really important to you, make sure you don't miss day one with Rabbi Seth Goldstein. Um, if you're super concerned about what's happening or rather not happening these days, uh, depending on who you talk to in Congress, make sure you tune in to Tammy Gilden's talk from Jewish Council for Public Affairs. Wednesday was a really engaging conversation that shed um, a, lot of, a lot of light on a lot of the human stories and the challenges that are happening here in Washington State with Jorge Barone from the Northwest Immigrants Rights Project. Uh, and then yesterday, we had the pleasure of really kind of honing in on uh, Jewish Family Service and the history and the work they do supporting refugees and asylees here uh, locally in our community. And before we move forward, I want to take a moment to thank our generous donors to the Federation for making programming like this possible. We couldn't do this without your support, as well as our long list of co-sponsors who have helped us publicize and recruit and get folks out to be listening and, and participants in action and partners in action this week, including the ADL Pacific Northwest, Bet Allah's Meditative Synagogue, Beth Havarim, Congregation Beth Shalom, Herzl Mertamid, IAC Seattle, J Street, J Connect, Jewish Coalition for Immigrant Justice Northwest, Jewish Family Service, Kavanaugh Cooperative, Seattle Hadassah, Secular Jewish Circle of Puget Sound, Temple Beth Am, Temple Beth El, Temple Beth Hakfi Lo, Temple Beth Or, Temple Beth Hirsch Sinai, and the Washington State Jewish Historical Society. We are truly honored to be partners with all of you in this work. And with that, I will go ahead and introduce our speaker. As I mentioned, Andrea Sirocco Nar is a co-founder of the Jewish Coalition for Immigrant Justice Northwest. The coalition aims to amplify immigrant advocacy within and beyond the Jewish community. Following the lead of individuals who are directly impacted, Andrea organizes with the Washington Immigrant Solidarity Network, or WISEN, to support efforts, including the Fair Fight Immigrant Bond Fund, to bond immigrants out of the Northwest Detention Center in Tacoma. Andrea, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, we know you have a lot going on, so we really value your time um, and what you bring today. And with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, except, sorry, our folks just wanted to remind you that if you have questions, please do type them in the Q&A box, and we'll get to them as soon as possible. Um, I will be trying to monitor it throughout the presentation, so if there's a moment and an opportunity to answer a question briefly, um, Andrea will do so, and we'll also try and uh, take a moment to make sure we have time to answer a question or two at the end. And with that, thanks, Andrea. I'll turn it over to you. Great. Um, thank you so much, Max, and thank you to uh, the Jewish Federation for including the Jewish Coalition in this event and for creating this space um, to talk, to come together and to learn and to take action. So a little bit about the Jewish Coalition for Immigrant Justice. Um, our goal really is to amplify the Jewish voice in the fight for immigrant justice by following the lead of directly impacted communities. Um, next slide. So we are an independent Jewish coalition. Uh, we focus on U.S. immigration and domestic policies. Um, our goals are to amplify Jewish voice in, on immigrant justice and ensure a visible Jewish presence. Uh, we also work to activate Jewish individuals and organizations to engage, educate, and inspire activism. And one of the things that we are really proud of and that is really integral to our work is to collaborate with synagogues, interfaith groups, um, and others engaged in immigrant advocacy. Next slide. 
So this slide shows a little bit about what it means to work in coalition. Uh, these were organizations involved in our uh, November bond fundraiser called Lech Laha Go Forth. And um, it was to benefit the Fair Fight Immigrant Bond Fund. And we had 11 different synagogues as co-sponsors, um, several churches, including the Church Council, which also works in coalition. Um, including immigrant advocacy groups as well. And so bring all of these groups together um, to talk about these issues that are so important um, has been really something that I think has helped build the movement and, and spread awareness and increase our effectiveness. Next slide. So I wanted to talk a little bit about connections to Jewish history and values. Jews have a long history as refugees and immigrants. And uh, we know from, you know, earlier this week, hearing from Rabbi Seth Goldstein, um, you know, that dating back to the Immigration Act of 1924, Jews have been impacted by policies targeted to prohibit them from entering the United States. Um, and Jews also have a long history as refugees in terms of, you know, being enslaved uh, in Egypt, and we just celebrated Passover recently. Um, this quote from Leviticus, the stranger who resides with you shall be to you as native among you, and you shall love him as yourself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. And I think this reminds us too that, you know, we, we are tasked with welcoming the stranger because we've been, we've been the stranger. Um, and I feel like that gives really a great deal of importance to our work. Um, we work as well to build relationships with directly impacted communities, and I'll talk a little bit more about what it means um, to do so um, and think about sort of Hineni, here I am. So one of the things we really value is this idea of showing up, of creating community, of really building and fostering relationships um, with organizations and individuals um, who are directly impacted in order to lift each other up. And so I wanted to share um, a quote um, by Indigenous Australian activist Lila Watson, who says, if you have come to help me, you are wasting my time, but if you believe that your liberation is tied to mine, then let's work together. And so because our collective humanity, our collective liberation is tied together, it is so important that we form these relationships and bonds. And, you know, when Jewish communities um, need others to also step up and be there for us, um, we have those relationships and we have that strength in coming together. Uh, I remember this must have been October 2018, just after the Pittsburgh shooting. I was at a meeting with the Washington Immigrant Solidarity Network and Monserrat Padilla, the code director, uh, we were talking about sort of the idea of working with directly impacted communities. And I'll never forget, she turned to me and she said, you are a directly impacted community. And I know that Jews historically, um, you know, have been directed, impactly directed communities, uh, directly impacted communities. I know we have been historically, but there are many reminders um, today that we continue to be directly impacted. Um, and I think the idea is that, you know, if, if we were to need support, that, that other communities would follow our lead and be there for us. And that's really what being an ally looks like. It's about centering the voices, the needs, and leadership of individuals and communities most impacted. Um, and so that's really our goal, and we view it as being solidarity instead of philanthropy. So instead of um, like doing charity work or like doing something for someone else, the idea is really working with them and having people who are directly impacted, who are experiencing um, you know, injustice connected to immigration issues, um, who are vulnerable, who are needing support, um, for them to be taking the initiative and saying, you know, this is actually what we need. We know best what our community needs. Um, and we're there to say, to be called upon, right, for how can we be there? How can we support? Um, how can we share resources? How can we help? Next slide. Thanks, Andrea. We did have a question come in that I think you're going to address later on, but I just want to raise it up, which is um, you spoke about organizations who were part of the event in November, and folks want to know how individuals um, can get involved and engage with the coalition. 
Oh, wonderful. Um, I'll, I have on a, the last slide I have our email and Facebook if people want to join our listserv and follow us and please join us. Um, so I'll, I'll share that at the end um, and we'll have information for future events. Um, no doubt more work we'll be doing to raise funds for the bond fund and for other important initiatives. Um, so some of our areas of involvement and if you're interested in getting involved, um, there's there's more than this, but to kind of you know give give some exposure to the different realms that we've been involved in as of late. Um, there's been a lot of work being done around accompaniment. Uh, the idea is um, to walk in community with individuals who are attending like USCIS appointments, biometrics appointments, bond hearings, and non-immigration state court hearings or appointments. And we found that accompanying, sort of showing up and being there as, as a witness, bearing witness to what's happening at, to bond hearings has uh, dramatically impacted cases, um, lowering the cost of bond so that people can uh, be freed from detention um, and even lowering the cost of bond. And also there's been uh, challenges in Washington state uh, with ICE uh, going into non-immigration state court hearings. So if someone is um, going into um, hearing because they've had a you know, traffic ticket or something like that, um, ICE has been apprehending individuals and the Jewish coalition was proud to support uh, the courts open to all bill uh, that passed in this past legislative session to prevent ICE um, from intervening in courts. Um, but that accompaniment work and that sort of show of solidarity of community wet members and bearing witness um, as something that um, has been very helpful and important. Um, and then another piece that we've been involved in is rapid response. And so in 2017, a hot, Wizen started a hotline uh, that was originally designed to report ICE activity in Washington state and people would go out and verify whether or not there was ICE activity and kind of spread awareness um, for communities who could be targeted. And now with the COVID packet, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, the hotline has actually pivoted to be a resource hotline and they've been receiving tons and tons and tons of calls. They've just recruited a whole round of volunteers and are looking for more um, who are bilingual, who can answer calls um, and provide resources. And Wizen is also about to launch a resource um, website so people can call and find out wherever they are in the state of Washington, uh, what resources you know, they might need, be it like support with food and, or rent um, or other, other types of needs. Um, so that's been, been really, really important. Um, and especially with all that's going on. Um, another piece is the Fair Fight Immigrant Bond Fund, which I'll talk about a little bit more. Uh, we also work to advocate for policies and to these last two initiatives that we've worked on uh, quite a bit, Keep Washington Working and Court Submental have both passed, um, which has been wonderful. And uh, hopefully we'll start seeing even more benefits from that legislation being put into effect. Um, and then we also work to organize and mobilize for actions and events. Next slide. Um, so this is a little bit more about the hotline. Um, and the idea is that rapid response teams are actually all over the state of Washington. And so they can provide that local support. The hotline number is here. Um, and part of the campaign is called Immigrant Health Response. Um, part of the goal also is to provide assurance that food access and COVID testing will not threaten individuals' pathway to citizenship um, because public charge, which Jorge Barron uh, spoke about, um, on Wednesday um, has also been a concern. Next slide. Um, the Fair Fight Immigrant Bond Fund um, is something that the coalition um, has spent a lot of time working on and helped uh, get up and running. So what it is is a com renewable community fund um, to bond individuals out of the Northwest Detention Center in Tacoma. And when I talked about following the lead of directly impacted communities, the reason why this bond fund was initiated is from someone who was in detention who joined who like reached out to Wizen and for resources and really expressed how integral it was for him to be out of detention um, one for his health and well-being 
um, two, to be reunited with like family or community um, and be part of a network where he could receive support. Um, and also unlike immigration, immigration court, unlike criminal court, individuals are not provided lawyers. And that's why you have, you know, toddlers defending themselves in court. And this is really problematic and it's really hard to find a lawyer while in detention to access resources. If you're trying to prove an asylum case and you need to call your home country, um, it can cost a dollar a minute to make phone calls in detention and the most individuals who have jobs in the detention center make per day is a dollar. So you can imagine how challenging it is to try to prove a case um, from, from inside. And so this individual who had been formerly detained uh, really expressed that this is a powerful tool for deportation defense. Um, this would be a way to reunite families um, and the cost of bond is quite high. So, so far we've raised enough money to bond out 45 people um, who come from over 16 different countries around the world. Um, but, you know, the ripple effects of reuniting families and communities, people can also potentially uh, work or keep their jobs, um, provide for families, have the emotional and, and also physical needs met as well. Um, Andrea, can you, sorry, can we go back a slide? Um, can you talk about why the cost of bonding someone out is so high? And a little bit about what, just very briefly, what it looks like, the difference between um, this court and a, a regular court that one of us might might think about. Yeah, so in addition to um, not having a lawyer provided for you, in uh, immigration court, um, you have to pay the full bond to get out. So in criminal court, generally you just are paying like 10% of the cost of bond, but in immigration court, they're paying the entire thing. So for a family, um, you know, to come up with somewhere between five and $35,000 is just an exorbitant amount of money. And we've seen that over the past uh, two years, the cost of bond keeps going up. There's no real uh, regulation of, you know, what immigration judges are deciding. They have some criteria that they're using to set bond. And honestly, only half of the people in det the detention center, Tacoma, half of the 1,500 people um, qualify for bond. So the other half don't. Um, they just have to stay in detention, you know, sort of indefinitely until their case is resolved. And if they appeal it, they're going to be there even longer. Um, and so, We've noticed with accompaniment, with people being there to sort of watch and show support for the individual, to show they're connected to a community, um, you know, that they have allies, um, and also to kind of hold the judges accountable. We have noticed that bonds often have, got, have been set lower, but there's so many sort of hurdles and pieces being put in place. Um, that are preventing people from being released from detention, preventing, making it even harder to prove asylum cases, um, just more and more challenges that this administration um, has been adding. Thank you. Next slide. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit more about the conditions in detention, especially with what's been going on with COVID-19. Um, the conditions are very cramped. People are in pods of about 60 uh, people per pod. Um, they have bunks that are certainly not six feet apart. Um, there are many people also who are high risk who are in detention and uh, the Northwest Immigrant Rights Project and the ACLU have been uh, suing to try to get people released who are high risk um, and so far have succeeded in getting about 16 people released. Um, but the judge has denied uh, further cases uh, for the releases because there aren't confirmed cases of COVID-19. But the issue is that if there were confirmed cases, the individuals who were at high risk likely would contract it, and so it would be too late. The other issue is that ICE and the GEO Group, the for-profit uh, publicly traded company who owns the detention center in Tacoma, um, they're not being transparent about testing. People are reporting symptoms that align with COVID symptoms. Um, but they're not actually testing um, or reporting results of tests. 
And so there are suspected cases there already, but we just, we don't have the information. Um, and we know that deportation flights are continuing and transfers between detention centers. And so it's a potential also that uh, COVID is being spread even further. And, uh, you know, this is also not violating, this is also violating a lot of Governor Inslee's sort of stay at home ideas. Um, and so there's a demand like, you know, free them all to release people from detention. Uh, La Resistencia is uh, a group that works a great deal. They're actually, I'll talk a little bit more about what they're doing today, but um, their group does a lot of activism around the detention center um, and monitoring hunger strikes that go on in the detention center and trying to give voice to the people who are de in detention. And um, recently uh, there was an action that detainees did in the yard um, there's like a soccer field to the left of them that you can't really see, but with their bodies, they got into the shape SOS and someone in detention uh, stated, the SOS distress signal is our desperate call for help from every elected official to respond and do whatever they can to get us out now. Our lives are in imminent danger and we do not want to die in detention. This is an emergency. People navigating their immigration cases should be able to do so with their families and community rather than behind bars. Next slide. Um, I also wanted to add that today is May Day. Today is International Workers Day. Um, it's a day that, you know, we should honor the individuals who are essential workers. And in this quote from Montserrat, um, immigrants, regardless of, the, of immigration status, are the backbone of this country and are being deemed essential workers under this pandemic. But we know that um, individuals who are undocumented are not having the resources they need. They're not being provided with, uh, you know, protective equipment. They are not, um, you know, they're on the front lines, they might not have access even to COVID testing should they contract symptoms. And there are a lot of concerns here, you know, and, and reasons to honor those who are putting themselves at risk, you know, farm workers who are feeding us, um, individuals who are working um, to provide food and supplies um, in the food industry and beyond, uh, people who are also making sure hospitals are sterile to prevent the spread of infection. Um, and so today, I think it's important to take a moment to acknowledge, um, acknowledge workers and, and also the demands that they're cared for and that they're kept safe as they're putting themselves at risk. Um, La Resistencia is broadcasting from the detention center today. Um, as part of May Day, there's also a caravan demonstration to Olympia um, that left from Casa Latina demanding that, and I'll talk about this in a, another minute, but that uh, Governor Inslee take action. There was also a caravan in Yakima to show support for farm workers. Uh, people were going to open their windows and play music and, and cheer and their support and, and also hand out food and water. Um, so these are some of the actions taking place um, in the state of Washington today. Um, and then I wanted to also include um, some calls to action. So one of the big uh, like funds and, and really one of the ways um, that you can get involved is uh, to support undocumented individuals and mixed status families in Washington state who didn't qualify for federal relief funds. So while individuals through the CARES Act are getting you know, checks in the mail and who can also access unemployment, individuals who are undocumented don't have these resources. Um, and so they're uh, individuals in the state of Washington, um, youth leaders, DACA recipients actually organize this fund and it has taken off. They've raised over a million dollars and had 14,000 applications from people in the state of Washington who are needing help. Um, so they're saying that $3 million is needed to fund those even just in the highest risk categories. Um, so if you're able to donate, this is an excellent thing that will provide immediate relief. They've already dispersed over $600,000 of dollars. And if you go to the next slide, another way to take action um, actually asks 
Governor Inslee to do what Governor Newsom did in California um, to create a Washington Worker Relief Fund that provides an ec economic assistance to undocumented Washingtonians. Um, and this would be extremely helpful. You know, it's being community organized right now, but really our state should be taking care of individuals within it. Um, and there's also an ask to create a permanent system that gives undocumented immigrants access to unemployment insurance. Um, so you can join this campaign. I'll, I'll include the links. Um, you can send a letter um, and demand that Governor Inslee and state legislators support our undocumented workers um, by taking these actions. Next slide. Um, so the first two I've just talked about, donating to the COVID-19 Relief Fund, sending a letter to Governor Jay Inslee and state legislators, um, asking them to create a Washington Worker Relief Fund, um, and also the permanent fund uh, to give access to unemployment insurance. Um, undocumented immigrants are paying in to Social Security and unemployment using ITIN numbers, um, but they're not actually receiving any of the benefits that come along with paying these taxes. Um, other actions to take, share information, spread the news about the Wisen hotline um, and the immigrant health response um, for individuals and families needing resources. Um, so this is a good place to point people and to spread the word. Um, also to donate to the Fair Fight Immigrant Bond Fund to bond individuals out of the detention center. Um, we can start getting people out, especially those who are high risk um, if they were to contract COVID. Um, and again, this will be another, another tool to provide support. Next slide. And also ways to stay engaged. So learning more about accompaniment. Um, there's a training coming up as well that we'll provide more information about. Um, and that's an excellent way to get involved and to kind of see up close uh, what the system looks like. Also to join the Free Them All campaign to release people from detention. This is a national campaign. You can learn about and support uh, Temple Beit Hatfilo uh, and their sanctuary efforts. Uh, Rabbi Seth Goldstein talked about their efforts on Monday and the Jewish Coalition was able to go down to Olympia um, and meet the individuals, the mother and son who are in sanctuary in their synagogue. Um, and what they've been doing is absolutely incredible work, interfaith work and community um, also has all been brought in to support this tremendous effort and spread awareness of sort of this unjust asylum policy um, that is preventing um, this family from, from getting asylum. There are also ways to continue learning um, to show solidarity with groups like WISEN, the Northwest Immigrant Rights Project, Colectiva Legal del Pueblo, La Resistencia, One America, and more. And lastly, to subscribe to our newsletter, um, please feel free to reach us, reach out to us via email at jcij.nw at gmail, um, or follow and like us on Facebook. You can send us a message there too, and we'll be happy to be in touch. Thank you so much, Andrea. That was incredibly enlightening and informative. Um, your work and the work of the coalition is inspiring. There's truly a significant need. Um, and I love, I love all of the opportunities that each of us have to get engaged with JCIJ. Um, and it seems like there's, there's an action opportunity for everybody, whether you have resources to give, whether you have time to give, uh, there's a combination of those two pieces. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time for any more questions at this time. However, we would ask that if you have questions directly for Andrea or for JCIJ to look at this uh, contact information here and take it down. We'll also be sending all of these action opportunities in our follow up email and they will remain on our landing page with a recording of this webinar. So if you want to spread awareness about the challenges and issues that are going on, we would encourage you to share this entire series with friends and family. Um, and, you know, again, as, as we have had other days, there'll be a pop-up uh, survey in your window after this webinar closes. And so we'd ask that you fill that out in, in response to what you heard and you learned this week, but also to share with us, you know, what kind of opportunities you would hope for in the future in terms of learning and advocacy, especially in this time, um, you know, when so many of us are, are really lucky to be homebound um, and also, you know, might have some more time on our hands um, to be able to give and to be able to take action. 
I want to give a big thank you again to our, our generous donors at the Federation for making programming like this possible. We couldn't do it without you. Our large list of co-sponsors, thank you so much. And also each of the contributing uh, individuals and organizations this week, Temple Bethcott Below, the Jewish Council for Public Affairs, Northwest Immigrants Rights Project, Jewish Family Service, and the Jewish Coalition for Immigrant Justice Northwest. It was a pleasure to partner with you to bring this content to our community. We look forward to providing more opportunities like this. Uh, and with that, we wish you all a great afternoon, uh, a wonderful Shabbat, Shabbat Shalom, uh, and wishing you all rest and peace uh, as we go into as we go into the, to the Sabbath. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Andrea, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, everyone have a great afternoon.